Hello, everybody. We're just a minute out from starting our session on communications in the new normal. We're going to give it one more minute. But in the meantime, as our speakers come together and as our uh, guests arrive, we just want to say how happy we are that everyone is here. Uh, we're so pleased that we've got with us this expert panel. Uh, we'd ask you that you please take advantage of the chat function, be present with us here in this session because this is 45 minutes that is gonna fly by. We've all got a lot to learn and you are all part of this, of this dynamic conversation. As we get started, in fact, as people are joining us for this session, we wanna do a quick pulse and we wanna find out if we can where everybody's joining from. So just go ahead and put in the chat, the city, state, however you feel comfortable, of course, identifying where you are, go ahead and tell us where you're joining from so that we know where everyone is coming in from. So go ahead and use that chat function. Just let us know where you're joining from today. I'm gonna put in here, dining room, Washington, DC. That's how, that's how technical I'm gonna get here. Hopefully everybody is having a chance to let us know a little bit about where they are. Welcome Brooklyn, we're happy you're here. New York always representing lots of DC that's gonna be here today. And speaking of DC, this conversation is a conversation that for me is a great honor because I'm having the chance to bring together people that I would have had over for lunch if we had been in any other situation. It's not quite lunchtime, we're still early morning in DC, but we're joined by people whose perspectives I respect because they come through very different career tracks, whose organizations are extremely different, but who bring one thing in common to the table here, and that is they know that communications is a part of the future because it's part of the solution. Maybe it's been part of problems, maybe it's complicating conversations that take place, but it's always a part of the solution. And great communications is what these people are about, great communicators. I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves in a few moments. You've seen their bios, and maybe I will ask one of my colleagues, if possible, uh, Erica, who is uh, an amazing uh, part of the intern force that, uh, that we get to work from with the Thurgood Marshall Fund. Um, I'd maybe like to see if Erica could even post the the link to the, the poster for today's session on our chat, fo uh, chat uh, box, if that's okay. But we're joined today by Brianna, representing the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We are so proud to have T.R. Straub with us from Russell Reynolds, Nene Diallo, current global, and of course, Michelle Russo from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. This is just an excellent chance for us to come together and, and learn from you. Now, the reality is everything has changed. And what I'd like to do as we start here is I'd like to see if I can even show this photograph. Let's see if this is gonna work here. Because technology is always tricky. Let's see if this can work. Can everybody see the photo that I'm showing here? I'm gonna get it up real close, close as I can. I'm showing you a photo from a monument here in Washington, DC. Some of you might even recognize it. Go ahead and put it in the, in the chat if you can recognize what this monument is. There's a monument in Washington, DC to one of the US presidents that actually focuses on a communications moment. There is a part of the, does anyone have it in there yet? No, no prize to the person who's got it in here yet. But there is a monument in Washington, DC to uh, to FDR, to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And one of the amazing things is this monument is this communications moment where they're talking about the fireside chat that we heard about in history, where communications or a message came into people's living rooms. And at that moment, I realized that we're actually in one another's living rooms right now. And COVID and this post-pandemic, current pandemic era has brought the communications function, the CCO, the Chief Communications Officer, the marketing officers, those who look at internal and external communications. We're in the living room right now in ways that are beyond just political messaging, but that living room chat is so dynamic because the mechanism that this, this man who represents every person, you know, a man in his living room, shoes off, uh, a humble situation representing women and men everywhere, we now have a dynamic one because we've got two-way, three-way quantum technology at our feet. So what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to start by asking our panelists to go around each of them and answer the question. In all of this change, in all of what I'm purporting to be great change in communications, has it really changed? And if so, how? So it's a huge question. I'm gonna ask for that speed round of, of reaction and introduction. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna ask for us to start with you, Michelle. And we're gonna go, Michelle, T.R. Nene Brianna. So let's start with you, Michelle. And please go ahead and give your give us the elevator introduction as you go. I'm Michelle Russo. Thanks so much. 
for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is the world's largest advocacy organization for business. And, um, you know, what hasn't changed, right, for anyone? I do like to believe that communications, the function in general, tends to be ahead of the curve on organizational change. We tend to be that tip of the tip of the spear trying to drive change within our organizations. And we know that communications, effective communications in the modern age is omni-channel and it's not linear and it's asynchronous. And so that's how we've all been living for the past year. So I do think that I felt like kind of more prepared than 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 some people that I had the opportunity to talk with in the early um, weeks on just being ready to embrace this change. I have I have an expression that says uh, embrace change or brace for impact. And I think comms people tend to be the ones that are generating change within their organization. So, yes, everything changed. But I think comms kind of. Stayed, stayed focused and got elevated in this moment. Excellent, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, we're gonna go, I think, I'm already forgetting my order here, we're gonna go over to you, TR. Why don't you answer this question? Has the function really changed you who views this tradecraft in a very uh, unique way? And if so, how? Yeah, so, um, so TR Straub, I'm with Russell Reynolds, so I focus on executive search in the corporate affairs world, and I also co-lead our diversity, equity, and inclusion practice, and, um, and I think that I, I would agree with Michelle entirely. I think that the, I don't know that the function has changed, but it certainly has been elevated, and I say pretty consistently that if organizations didn't recognize the value of communications and corporate affairs more broadly, they certainly do now, and I think that there's a lot of organizations that are either investing in, like, uh, raising up the seniority of the function, raising up the strategic nature of the function, having them the, the these leaders formally sit around the, the senior leadership table because they were thrust into, if they weren't already sitting there, thrust into a situation where they were playing that senior executive uh, executive council role over the past year. And I just think that the playing the role of business strategist, playing the role of being someone that can think in an integrated way about external factors, internal factors. I mean, I think employee communications in, in a lot of ways was the redheaded stepchild of the function and all of a sudden is having its like sexy moment in the sun. And um, and I think that it just shows that employees are incredibly critical. Communications plays a critical role of engagement internally and externally and also driving business outcomes. And I think it, it also just means that the, this job is harder. Um, and that is, it, it, I, um, and I say that with, with empathy as someone that is not a practitioner, but as a recruiter, um, and to all of you watching here today, just like, I, I feel for you, um, but the bar is, is raising and you have to run to keep up. So you've, you've laid out a couple of things here. I'm gonna come back to those. I love this idea that instead of being a nice to have, the pandemic reality helped people at the senior level realize this is a must have. And you have talked about strategy in so many ways. I'm gonna come back to that where the communications function isn't just a go and do, it's really part of that corporate strategy, organizational strategy. Now, they talk to us, has it changed? Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, Nene Diallo, Senior Vice President with Current Global. We are a global communications firm. And, you know, I echo what Michelle NTR just said. Um, over the last year, companies were forced to evolve and flex in real time. And with Um, and then also social unrest, you know, trust fell, fears rose, and people are now looking at com to companies and brands to be the messenger, to fill the vacuum that the, you know, that they weren't probably seeing in their elected officials. And so that required a whole new kind of communicator and communications where we needed to be more hum human, people needed to be more agile, and our storytelling needed to be a little bit more people focused. Um, less talk, more action. Um, people are now looking to companies to drive the message and to lead them. Um, so I think it's a huge opportunity that we have right now in the communication space. And I think, you know, TR, what you're doing with DEI, extremely critical. DEI now needs to be brought into the fabric of what uh, companies are doing. It has to be part and parcel of the operations, not just a stand aside and a nice to have for the internal um, functions of an organization, but also externally. How are they communicating DEI and what it means to them, not just internally, but externally to society. So 
you know, I hope we'll be able to dive into that a little bit more, but completely agree with the both of you. So that, that perfectly human aspect, both of the need and the spokesperson and the delivery mechanism. Thank you. Which Brianna, I think opens us up perfectly to you and your, and your perspective and your unique role at the USHCC. What uh, thank you again, Aaron, for bringing us together. Brianna Dimas, Vice President of Programs and Communications for the U.S. Hispanic Chamber here in Washington, D.C. Absolutely agree with uh, my colleagues on this panel. It's not so much that things have changed. They've sped up and they've amplified more than ever. Uh, what used to be a social media calendar for a whole month might be all in one week or one day, depending on what's happening and what resources we're trying to get out. We've always been in the small business space, sharing resources, sharing education, helping businesses scale up and grow, but now with everyone just in the same space trying to keep their doors open as small businesses, everything has just shifted to the immediate. What can we give someone today on the phone, online, on social media? Uh, what is tangible? What is short and to the point and going to help them today? And so I think that we've all had to pivot our strategy a little bit, even though it's, uh, it's what we've always been doing, just uh, amplified and on fire. This is what I love about this mechanism here. And I love that at Horasis, we've been you know, brought to this angle, even though we had a very nicely orchestrated uh, idea and agenda about what we were gonna talk to, the panelists have already brought us to this idea about the C-suite. So let's get there, right? This is, this is maybe less classical music and more jazz, this conversation. So in that jazz spirit, I wanna get there. Each of you have mentioned this. And what I'd love to do is, Michelle, I'd like to, to go right to you first. Has the C-suite done what TR and Brianna and Nene mentioned, has the C-suite really recognized that it's not just about an elevation of the role in terms of title, but in terms of what they need in a partner? Would you talk to us about the C-suite, Michelle, in this new normal, in this new normal where both tactics and approach have changed? What have you viewed? Well, um, it's a great question. And I have to say uh, that I don't know that I appreciate how much the fact that uh, I'm now at an organization and I was previously at a very different type of organization, a media company, and now I'm at an advocacy and we care very much like communications is the product of chamber, right? How we communicate, how we're representing our, the interests of our members. And at my last job um, uh, was global communications at Discovery, the media company, again, communications had a very firm seat at that strategy table in the C-suite um, in, you know, the ear of the CEO. Um, so I don't know what it's like to not have that. Uh, TR and others have come to me with jobs where I suspected that communications wouldn't have that seat at the table and, uh, and, and I wasn't interested in a situation like that. But you have to, I think effective communications drives business outcomes, right? It always comes back to what are you trying to drive for the organization? And if you if you, you can strengthen your seat at the table, no question that the seat got stronger in the past year, especially on commu uh, employee communications, because, yes, that might not have been an, a valued function in the past, but now it just elevated. How are we keeping our employees safe? How are we making sure that they're, we're protecting them and our customers? And all of that became very fundamental to the way you communicate externally. Um, and just always, if you if, if you're if you're struggling to get that strong seat at the C-suite table, you need to talk to your other leaders and your peers in a way that they can hear it, which is business outcomes. It's very important that our employees are the biggest brand ambassadors and we treat them as a primary audience for our messages. Um, and because I always say, like, if you can't fix and convince people on the inside, you're not going to have much luck convincing them on the outside, right? And I, I think that this, this idea about, and you said it first, Michelle, this idea that omnichannel means a lot of things, right? It can mean everything that we're doing from owned media to earned media, paid, the amazing work that our colleagues do who run who run everything from print campaigns to phenomenal digital, but that employee relationship, that internal and external wall kind of came down in the new normal. Maybe it was coming down. Maybe some of you were the, the people calling for the wall to come down as communications professionals, but the new normal maybe brought the wall down even faster. I'm loving this. And I want to come back to internal, not fair to have 45 minutes. I could handle 45 hours with, with your brains here on, on this. But in the meantime, let's go to you, Nene. I know that this idea about the C-suite commitment is something that you 
have, have talked about a lot and that current global cares about. What, what do you see as this as this uh, the C suite reality now that communications is in a new normal? Absolutely. Um, you know, and I will just say real quickly, just to internal communications that, you know, taking care of your employees and engaging with them is very, very key um, because we're in, a, we're in a time right now where the employees now have a platforms to speak out against what's happening internally. I think we saw that happen over the last couple of years with a, a big um, social media company I will not name. Um, but coming back to, uh, to your question, um, I think people now expect company CEOs to have an opinion on everything from whether it's getting people back to work to driving diversity, equity, and inclusion through their organizations to how they feel about people storming our nation's capital, right? Um, silence is now being perceived as complicity on across many issues. And so leaders themselves have had to speak up, step up, and stand out like never before. Um, but they're investing in communications in the right way. And, you know, we're seeing them, you know, spend less on paid um, media and really looking at earned media and owned communications through important storytelling. Um, so I think that companies, you know, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use companies like a Nike, like a Ben and Jerry's, you know, who really have, you know, filled again the void that, you know, our elected leaders, you know, um, didn't fill before with, you know, appropriate messaging where they're saying, hey, this is where we stand. This is how we're going to tackle certain issues um, because what's happening on the outside is affecting the people who are working on the inside to us. So again, bringing it back to that internal communication so, and, and employee engagement. Um, so I think that, you know, again, we're in a space where companies are really looking to make a stand and they are putting their money where their mouth is right now. And that's investing in where they should have been investing before and that's in comms. Don't just come to us when there's a crisis. <laughs> don't don't just come to us when there's a crisis. <laughs> and and your, your, your brain is faster than my pen. You said something about, and I want you to go ahead and repeat it because I think we needed it. There are, the, there are people on this call who are at every edge of the every um, um, moment in the career spectrum. We've got some people starting their comms careers, and I'm on the phone with people who are you know, my ultimate comms mentors, right, that have had amazing careers. But you said stand up, show up. What was it again? When they give us that that trip, that 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 trio of words. What did I say? Stand it up, was, show up. It was so good. I uh, think it was speak up. It was up. so good. Speak yeah, <laughs> we're gonna do a little. We'll, we'll do a little bit of history on this. Leaders have had to speak up, step up, and stand out. Oh, so good. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Yes. That idea about how the new normal has said, where many people were talking about impact, talking about our uh, commitments as organizations to what it means, whether you call it. CSR, ESG, I mean, they're all part of important Venn diagrams that intersect, but the idea about that, that purpose is there. Um, Brianna, I'm gonna go to you on this question about the C-suite. You know it's coming TR, and you know I'm gonna ask you a hard follow-up on it as well, but Brianna, what have you seen? And also, would you say something, because I think your perspective with the membership of the USHCC is, is so interesting. It's, it's some of the largest, most important corporations, but also you've taught me that it's about what you're learning from some of the small businesses in America as well. So what have you seen? Absolutely. I think that across the C-suite, we've definitely seen patterns on keeping messages short to the point. They know that their audience, their customers, a lot of them are in crisis as well. So I, we have definitely seen a wake up call, I would say, across the C-suite that now is not the time for a three page press release or a 10 page PDF unless it is directly helping your customers or consumers in some way. A lot of new resource pages. I've noticed a huge rise in bilingual materials, which I think is so important. I think uh, access to information is being taken more seriously during the pandemic, which is a, a silver lining for us, of course, but absolutely in the small business community as well. Uh, some of them themselves, while in crisis, are creating new resources, are trying to help their communities, are starting, of course, uh, grassroots, you know, food drives, PPE supply drives, things like that in their community, but uh, also trying to keep their marketing strategy resource based, um, which has been a, a huge shift. And uh, like Nene said, I agree that many companies and leaders are not being shy about advocacy, even if it's traditionally not been in their lane. So we know there's some corporations that have always been loud, even before the pandemic on political issues. But right now we've seen that shift, whether it's uh, in politics or advocacy, or but even in the importance of wearing masks, uh, following CDC guidelines of all of the pandemic sort of 
some people call it politics, but just the the awareness of different positions for safety uh, in our communities and in our businesses, I think, has really risen to the top. You know, this is this is fascinating, this idea. And I'm glad you brought it down to the very tangible, if you don't have to find mine, the masks, you know, that we all have sitting around in our in our desks, in our cars, in our in our homes. But the fact that that messaging is not that we're complying just because we have to, but because we we want to. Right. And I guess COVID has brought all of that reality to us, whether it's for the, the, the well-being of our employees, but our customers, the stakeholders who we ultimately represent. It, it, TR, uh, you know, I don't want to embarrass you, but I know that you see inside of C-suites uh, more closely than probably more, most C-suites do. So without, without breaking any confidences, do you feel like the C-suites caught up to what you mentioned at the beginning in terms of, of that reality of the function and what needs to happen? So yes and no. I mean, it's it's really organizationally dependent, and I think you, there are some that have really stepped up and are excelling, and others that are playing catch up. I mean, I will say that I think across the board there is a recognition that this function is critical, and that the work that you do as communications professionals is absolutely integral to a company's success. I think that what good looks like in practice, there's there's varying levels of education and awareness related to that, and and that I think like what good looks like still looks differently company by company, at least in terms of how that how that actually shows up day to day. Um, I mean, I do think that there's, um, I think, I think that there's, there's also just an awareness that um, like communications is not about like putting lipstick on a pig and that like there have, like you have to have the goods to back it up. And, and I do think that there's more awareness of that as things are increasingly transparent, there's more access to information. um, And whether that's a you know, access is, it cuts both ways because we have an overwhelming volume of content that we're digesting on a daily basis. Um, but I do think that like there's comms will only get you so far if you don't have the, the 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 content and the substance in your organization to back it up. And that's I think like the role that communicators as business strategists can play in saying like we can do this and it'll buy us a little bit of time. But the reality is like. That, like this will be uncovered or like we need to make good on these promises and we can state an aspirational tone. But if we're not actually going to live up to that promise, like that's going to become a problem down the road. Um, and I think that also there's this this role of the called chief communications officer, chief corporate affairs officer is sort of like being the connective tissue across an organization. Because if you're doing your job and doing it well, you're spending time with your HR colleagues, your ops colleagues, your folks in the finance organization, because you need to have a pulse on all the various moving pieces and sort of pull it together. And that puts you in a unique position, yes, to tell the story, but also to sort of like play that role of counselor to push back and say, you know, this is happening, this part of the organization, and this is connected over here. Like I see what's sort of coming down the pike and we should probably pump the brakes a little bit and, and think about how we address it. The, the your responsibilities need to go beyond just the positioning piece of this. Like, yes, that is an output, um, but as strategic counselors, you're, you, you, you play a much more important role than that. Do you know, it feels like there's a follow-on discussion at some point. I would love, whether it be our professional organizations, you know, Page or some of the, the, the other great organizations out there, PRSA, it feels like there's time for a session about don't shoot the messenger. When your corporate affairs communications officer is bringing you that message, not just because of how it plays in the market, but where we're going, don't shoot your counselor when your communications or corporate affairs officer is trying to help us match that aspirational goal with the action. Wow, at Philip Morris International, are, are we ever aware of that idea about making sure that the aspirational, what you say in a big, bold transformation goal is matching what you're doing because there is that need, there is that need to match what you're doing in our case, moving towards a smoke-free future with what you've said you're going to do. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move the order around a little bit, and this is where I think things are going to really get interesting. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prep everyone here, and I'm going to ask everyone who's, who's joined us, there are more than 30 people who've joined us, I want you to be generous and share this with somebody, either someone in your, your organization, someone you manage, someone who's looking for an informational or, uh, interview, because I think the next five minutes are going to be key. So Susan Barrows Libby, whom I think is a great communications uh, example, I love being arms in arm with her as a professional, as a professional in, in our space. She talked about how internal comms has now become essential in operations. I don't want to talk just about internal comms, but what is essential in operations? I love that Susan brought this up in our in our conversation. I'm going to ask TR for you to start us. So we're going to reverse a little bit around. I'm going to ask you who, as a communications pro right now, is really excelling, what they've got, what it is, what the traits, what, the, what they bring to the table, the people who are excelling in their career, who are helping their organizations, 
what it is that they've got that they're leveraging as a pro to get the job done for that bottom line. Well, for the for the for the for the for the the stock price, the the mission statement, uh, for the stakeholders, and for the good of the world. So I'm gonna and I, I think Tr, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you that because you look at communications professionals' tactics all the day. Then I'm gonna go to Michelle. I know you see this all the time. We're gonna go to Brianna from your members and those you see, and we're gonna end with you and maybe from a client perspective. And I know that you've also you also know who's amazing, uh, who you've worked with and who you admire. So uh, let's start with you, TR. I did a little bit of vamping so that you got some time to get ready for it. But what communications pros, what are they bringing in their toolbox that right now in the new normal is shining? So I think that, um, so for, I'll, I'll just like double click on the point about business strategy again. And, and, and I say business, like lowercase b is organizational strategy, whatever that means for your organization. And if you can't, and like for anyone that's interviewing a job for a job that I'm handling, like I'm going to ask you, like, what is like, what was the business strategy and how did you support that strategy? And then derive from that a functional strategy that supported that business strategy. And you need to be able to articulate that flow. And if you can't, then I think it's, it doesn't mean that you're bad at your job. It just means that you need to like probably reframe the way that you're thinking about it and, and recalibrate your approach. Um, I think the other thing too, like I, I, I find that I'm using the word like adjacencies more and more and more. And I think that it is related to whether it's marketing and brand or government affairs and policy or impact in whatever, whatever that means for different organizations, whether it's like community engagement or social impact or partnerships or ESG or DEI. Um, I think that figuring out how you um, like uh, reorient your communications so that it is also like tapping into your, your cross-functional partners within the organization, because that's only going to allow you to have an even greater impact. Um, and I think that there's this there are there are issues that come up over and over and over again. And I think there's also this level of like a campaign orientation that you kind of need to have to be able to figure out, like we have this macro strategy that we're putting in place and then we have these micro issues that are popping up and how are we going to keep the drumbeat and keep going at the macro level and also address the things that are popping up. And I think that requires a lot of versatility, a lot of um, sort of the phrase flying by the seat of your pants um, makes it seem like there's no preparation, but like that's a, that's a real element of it. You have to be able to sort of uh, just adjust on the fly. So the, the agility, but how did it ladder up to the strategy? And I think this, this idea, it's interesting. The campaign mentality is also something where we've seen it. I think Brianna, you mentioned it, right? The fact that it's 24 hours, but it's 24 hours inside the hours. So those campaigns are happening. Michelle, I love that the chamber sees this. I love that your members and peers, who, who, who are the stars over the past year that are becoming our new normal star athletes? It's a great question. So without naming names, there's, there's many. There's some on the call uh, as well. Um, I'll say you, you asked the question in, in two different ways. So I'll answer it the way about what skills are they leveraging that are being really effective. So back to this business point, if you as a, you know, a communications professional, and this is what I was talking about, talking with other members of the C-suite or around the organization that TR called connective tissue, making sure they know you're invested in their success, talking to them in terms of driving their goals, not having your own communications goals, but the communications goals as an out put of the, the different operational goals across the business. I think that's really important because that gets people bought in on your strategy and understanding that, that it is a joint uh, a, a thought partnership or in terms of strategy. And that builds credibility and it also builds effectiveness. Um, and then second is I think it's really important and somebody touched on this a few minutes ago. It's really important that communications people are they evangelize out, but they also bring hard truths in, right? It's those conversations where you're having to say, I know you want to say this, but here's, you know, here's how it's going to be perceived and just really building the trust and knowing that your candor and your authenticity and as long as you can back it up, absolutely critical for the success of any communications and um, brand you know, brand manifestation. Um, if you're if you're just not pretending, you know, just the good news person. Somebody called it, you know, bringing the bad news in. You, you've got to do that, and it's really hard um, to tell powerful people uh, what what you think. Um, but it's really important, and you just have to be fearless about it. 
because that's your job. And that so, that you you said credibility twice, Michelle, and I think that that is both for as as the professional because you're drawing the lines to the strategy, as you said, but also that credibility to have your the awareness of what's happening externally. So th- thank you for thank you for bringing that. I'm um, you're making me uncomfortable and excited today, you panelists, because I'm realizing just how much work we have to do. I know that there's a lot to do, but you're making me uncomfortable that we've got even more to do. Brianna, wh- who, who, are the, who are the stars? For sure. I would say that the people thriving right now um, internally, when we talk a lot about internal communication today, are those cutting the red tape of the communications bureaucracy system of the past of internal communications. I know that nonprofit or corporate alike, you know, there used to be a very specific process where every tweet and message had to go through weeks of review and a process and a campaign and, you know, things were thought months ahead. And we don't have that luxury right now with a lot of things going on. So we know timeliness is everything. So I'm proud that a lot of companies, uh, including my own, are embracing that as an opportunity. You know, what can we uh, change and pivot to really get information out quickly? But with that comes risk and it makes people nervous. And it's it's just it's really adjusting the way that things have been done in the past. Um, I think that the work life balance aspect is important to this conversation, too, because there's pros and cons to that. But I think long gone are those days of, you know, eight to five clock out. See you tomorrow. You know, in the communication space, we don't have that luxury. You know, we're translating materials and trying to get deadlines out, whether it's coming out at night or not. Um, You look at the political part of this uh, announcements that are coming out, you know, at night or before the news the next day. And you have to kind of roll with the punches. And I think that um, it's an opportunity. And we've also talked a lot today about diversity. And I think that's important, too, because so many important conversations are rising to the surface when it comes to seats at the table, when it comes to professional development and growth opportunities for employees of color and great conversations. Um, But there's also pushback because all eyes are on your marketing and communications, right? That action behind the marketing. Are you saying you're doing it or are you doing it? Uh, Are you talking the talk or walking the walk, right? And I think that in the past, that was easier to get away with, uh, to be honest. And now I think uh, in our modern age, people are watching what you're doing and not just watching it, but tracking it. Uh, I think that follow up and follow through has a different definition these days. So your audience is definitely going to call you out if they don't feel like you're being honest about something, which is important to this uh, conversation. You know, that that the diversity and inclusion portion of our conversation, which I think you're bringing us to, I, I'm, Nana, I'm coming to you on the who's thriving part. You know, you, you, you answered a, a, and anticipated a question, Brianna, for me that I'm really grateful for, because in all of the work about defining what this new normal has done, you, you raised one, right? It's taken away the, the red tape uh, excuses that weren't necessary anymore. Compliance, necessary. Responsibility, authenticity, necessary. But were there things that now in an urgent situation, not that anyone would have wished the situation where, where there's been loss, loss of life, loss of opportunity, loss of, of experience, right? I mean, we're, this is a tender time for our society. But as, as communicators, we've now been given the excuse to go and say, wait a minute, certain processes were slowing us down. We're not making us good communicators. Now on the diversity and inclusion side, this is absolutely key. I mean, all of the work at, at, at Philip Morris International, we've been doing work around the new normal. And I'm showing you a, 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 the draft version that we've been working with and sharing with many of you and happy to share with you. But time and time again, this question about diversity and inclusion going from something that was seen as an optional to an integral. And then I think as some of you were saying in the chat, something that cannot be window dressing, something that is, that is, that, that there are numbers behind, people behind, leadership behind is, is really key. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm grateful that you raised that because it's, it's, it's part of our function. Nana, I'm going to ask you to answer the who's thriving and what attributes are thriving question. And then I'm going to ask our colleagues who haven't had a chance to talk about uh, uh, diversity and inclusion. Obviously, we know TR, this has been a, 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 an important part of your portfolio. And I know Michelle, you're working on it. So Nana, I'm going to ask you to answer both. And then we'll go to TR and Michelle on this issue of diversity. Sure. Um, I mean, I think without calling out any particular companies, I think an industry that's really having a moment right now is the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, with the vaccine vaccinations and, you know, that have been, been rolled out, there are companies that I didn't even know existed before <laughs> this happened. So I think, you know, for an industry that, you know, basically is having a moment um, after probably decades of backlash on pricing issues and more, 
you know, people are really looking to them to get us out of this pandemic and to really open up the world so that we can get back to whatever new normal is going to look like. Um, and the reputation has been improved by it, I think. Um, and then, you know, just to, you know, maybe call out one company, um, Abbott, for example, who stepped up, you know, really quickly and made about five different types of COVID-19 tests. And, you know, now they're a household name. Um, so I think the pharmaceutical industry is having a moment and are, you know, doing their best to communicate. Um, obviously, they've got the, you know, political voices that have to be their, their mouthpieces, but I think they're doing a great job right now. Um, getting to the diversity and inclusion part, I think, you know, I'll be remiss to, you know, not mention what's happening right now in, in, our, in our country, you know, with the attacks on the Asian community. And honestly, you know, I've said this in a couple of posts on LinkedIn, like, we can't be standing for one group, you know, that I'm a part of and not stand for others. If we believe in equity and inclusion, then we all need to raise our voices against hate, against violence, against all groups. Um, and so I, I stand with, you know, my Asian brothers and sisters right now. But um, we are coming on the year um, in a couple of months of the George Floyd death, the protests that really appended this country. And Last year, lots of companies made statements. It's going to be a year. Everybody's going to be looking to those companies and others. What have you done? You know, did you just issue the statement? Did you just, you know, you know, make a donation to an HBCU? It has to go beyond that. Now it's about action behind the words, you know, like we've just been saying. And so I would implore all of us who maybe are representing companies or within our organizations you know, look internally to see how are you addressing diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in your organization. Um, companies who may have made the statements, what have we done besides just give money to an organization that we think we're supporting? Are we really, you know, looking at our talent pipeline and really ensuring that we are bringing in um, diverse talent and really nurturing that talent? It's not enough just to bring in the, you know, black and brown face and say, hey, but check that box, you know, oh, we've got somebody in a senior position. Oh, we're bringing in a bunch of interns. How are you developing them? How are you making and making sure that they are, they feel included? You know, nobody wants to be saying, you know, hey, I was the check the box person. You know, how are you making them feel like they are really part and parcel of your organization, that they are, that they are adding value and that they deserve to be there, not because of a color. That, or, or gender that they're checking the box for you for. So that's my soapbox thank you. moment. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a box that's a foundation for all of us. And, and you, this idea about signaling uh, is, is something that I think people are aware of more and more. A couple of you have mentioned it, that, that then the new normal, I guess we've all had a year where, and I think David mentioned this in the chat, some things, you know, we'll go through pandemic uh, uh, adjustment for maybe years, you know, maybe for a while, but where we're going and the progress we're making on inclusion has to be more than a signal. It has to be a shift. It has to really be a shift. TR, I know that this is something that both you lead on at Russell Reynolds, but you're a leader on as a, as a colleague. Are we, did we, are we leveraging an opportunity here? Or are we missing it when it comes to diversity and inclusion as communicators and as people who are helping lead business? Um, I mean, so I think by and large, I think that like organizations are seizing the opportunity um, to do something. Now, the that it falls on a spectrum and it varies widely. Again, organization by organization, um, and I think there's two. I think there's two dimensions to this. And and, and in our work at, at Russell Reynolds, we do both the like organizational consulting pieces, looking at organizational design, DEI leadership internally, some of the cultural pieces, like looking at levels of belonging and trying to slice and dice it based on seniority in organization, demographic background, regional, um, where they sit regionally, because all of those different factors show up, like uh, uh, cause employees to show up differently. And like inclusion means different things to different people. And so it's really complicated. And there's that internal piece. But then there's also the piece, like, how do you as an organization leverage your resources and do so in a way that is aligned with your mission and purpose as an organization to then affect change externally? And I think that there is this increasing conversation about equity as a concept. Like internally, yes, like you want to be able to create a sense of belonging and organizations by and large are not as diverse as they need to be. Um, if they do at the macro level have a, a, a level of diversity that's at parity with the external community as you go up in, in seniority, that that really trickles uh, trickles away. 
Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there. But I think even more than that, and, and you made the uh, you raised the example about the pharmaceutical industry, and there's all like all these issues around like pricing and access, which have been longstanding. There's also questions related to clinical trials and diversity of clinical trials and what that means for patient outcomes. And that's something that companies are paying more attention to. Um, I think you can think about like the retail sector increasingly thinking about like having what are those, like black owned businesses and products that show up that are going to be more representative of the, the employees that are working in stores and, and the uh, the customers that they're engaging with at the store level is like things like that, figuring out like how you can draw that through line from our internal culture to the products and services that we're providing externally and doing so in a way that is true to who you are as a business and what your like what your end goals are. Um, because that is ultimately going to, I think, bring people along in a way that they're going to see the the purpose of what they're doing and how it connects to their day to day work. And it's not just a like nice to have or a um, like an icing on the cake thing that we're doing because it feels good. But it is both like doing like good business and doing good by doing business. And I know that's like a bit of a cliche at this point, but I think it's really I think it's really true, and it's showing up more and more. And. And if if people are understanding that the cliche always had meeting and we're we're working on it, I think you're seeing them coming back to the table saying it's it's going to take a lot more work, right? This takes a lot and a long term effort. This is not Nene. You said check the box as it relates to maybe some people uh, inclusion that's happening, but really including it as the strategy is a continuous uh, thing. Michelle, you, I, I've I've been in in a couple of professional fora where you've addressed this. What, what do you see? Uh, from your perspective, both from the chamber's perspective and also as as a as a person who's been in and out of different parts of of the corporate world. So I think we're touching on a couple themes of this conversation. So I'm going to try to pull a couple of the threads together. One is around authenticity and understanding and having a real true north and purpose for your organization and being very clear on that, which is related to employee communications as well. And so at the chamber, we know what our true north is create jobs, grow the economy, and save the nation's problems. Help our members do that. We don't do that. We help our members create jobs, grow the economy, and solve the nation's problems. We've seen that in spades over the past year. And maybe not the jobs. We've lost a lot of jobs. There's also open jobs. But so in the moment of the George Floyd situation a year ago, if we know what our true north is and we stay very true to that every single day that we, we come into work or not come into work, what was our show, not tell? We're an organization of action. What were we going to do? So we waited a beat before we put out our statement because we're an organization of action. And so we, we took, you know, 24, 48 hours and we said, we're going to have a national summit on this topic. We're going to release a data set because we base our policy recommendations in data. You may not agree with all of our recommendations, but you can't deny the, the data that we're presenting as foundational to making our argument. And we put out this and, and we built on the work that we've done with organizations like the Kellogg Foundation that we've been working with for a couple of years on the business case for racial equity, right? So we showed up and we said, here are the, gonna be the four pillars of our work that build on long-term work that the chamber's already been doing in this space and really elevate it. We had a national summit, Gail King from CBS was um, was our host and we, we elevated the conversation. And since then in the past year, and in that moment, we got a lot of demand from our members. Our members needed our leadership on this. They needed us to convene them and share best practices from across the spectrum of the economy and the different industries that we represent, small businesses, large businesses. And there was such huge demand for the work and there's been tremendous engagement from our member companies in this in the solutions in terms of and Michelle, I'm going to ask, at every level. And I'm going to ask you to share some of those resources with us, which I know the chamber does, but we'll, we'll do some LinkedIn follow-up because it's just a rich, sure. a rich, a treasure trove of, of, of things that we shouldn't assume don't exist. They exist. So we're, we're, we're on, on, um, it's on us right now to be able to show that we're leveraging those, those materials and learning from them. As we come to a close, Melissa, someone who's a great communicator who's in our chat, mentioned the power of words and trust. I'd like to uh, ask our, our panelists in the last minute that we have, and I know it's possible to do this, to answer the question. They're really making up the greatest tweet of today for our communication sector. To succeed as a communicator in the new normal, you must be dot, dot, dot. We're going to do it in one minute if we can. They're just going to end that sentence with the word. 
to be a communicator to succeed in the in the new normal, you must be. Brianna, we'll start with you and we'll go Brianna, Michelle, Nene, TR. Resilient. Brave. Authentic. I'll say cross-functional. Okay. Erica, did we get all those? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say generous. And I think that's what each of you have been with your ideas, with your time, with your devotion to what it means to, to be communicating about people. And whether it be in, in my role at Philip Morris International, uh, as part of a communications community like you, we're all trying to transform. And it's really remarkable to be part of, of, a, of a trade craft that's sharing as we go. I wanna thank our panelists. I wanna thank all of you for being part of this, of this dialogue here at Horasis and wish you I'm not going to say uh, good luck. I'm going to say a lot of great health and a lot of great communications uh, because I think that's what's going to make it all come together. So thanks to each of you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Take care, everyone.